Oh, if you'd like to turn your Bibles, turn to the Old Testament and the book of Ruth. And while they're figuring out the uh, screen, and they'll catch up in a moment. The title of this series is called The Search for Love. Uh, there's a big emphasis in on February about love because Valentine's Day is coming up. But you've got to understand that there are a lot of, that there are different kinds of love. Valentine's Day is about romantic love, and that's good, and that's important. And, uh, but that's far from the most important kind of love that we need. We tend to look at the book of Ruth. Most of us remember it from our Sunday school days. And we would go there and think of it as a children's story. But it's far from a children's story. It really is, as the title of this series is, the search for love. But the word that is central in this book is, uh, the Hebrew word is kesed. It's a hard word to translate. Uh, most often it's translated as mercy, but uh, a lot of people translate it as steadfast love. It's not love that's just sort of a good feel feeling. But it's love that is always issued forth in some kind of action. It's the kind of love that we receive from God where he says that he will give us, that God is full of mercy full of this kind of love. Now, when we look here, and we're going to go ahead and start in Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. The name of his two sons were Malan and Kylan, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malan and Kylian also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. This morning we're going to talk about the need for love. And the need for love is because we face disaster. We have tremendous needs. And that's what happens here. It begins in the house with no bread. Now, Naomi and her family lived in Bethlehem. And the word Bethlehem means house of bread. And it's ironic that the house of bread has become the house with no bread. We find that happens a lot. 
I see it in the church world. You see where people go to the church, which should also be a house of bread. And sometimes the bread of life is missing. And there is no bread in the house of bread. And so there's a famine in Bethlehem. There's a famine there. There's insufficient food. What are we going to do? Now what's interesting here is that the decision is to move. And they decide to move to Moab. Now why do we choose to make moves sometimes? And that's because there is a search for new bread. We decide, can't find it here, I'm going to go someplace else. There's this search for new bread and we think there everything is going to be okay. It's amazing, though, how often it doesn't turn out that way. We see this story played out many times in Scripture. It begins in the book of Genesis with Abraham. Abraham goes, as God has led him, to the land of Canaan. And everything's going good there for a while. And then there's a famine and what does Abraham decide to do? He decides, I'm going to go to Egypt. And that's the problem that too often times we go to places like Egypt and Moab because we look over there and we say, well, there's bread there and I'm in a place with no bread, so I'm going to go there. And we never count the cost. Of leaving. We don't count that cost. For Abraham, he would go down to Egypt and he would get into trouble and would eventually be run out of the land. It didn't stop there, but later on, he comes back and his flocks increase and everything, and the he gets too big and he gets too large and there is contention between him and his workers and his nephew Lot and his workers because there's just too big. The land cannot support them. Well, why are they too big? Well, because they didn't go through the famine and the famine would have cut things down. But, you know, sometimes we just can't abide there. We can't stand to go through famine times. We've got to move. We've got to go somewhere else. And so he comes back, and it's time to make a decision. And he said, Lot, you go this way, and I'll go that way. Or you go that way and I'll go this way. You, you make the choice here. And Lot makes the choice. He makes the choice for Sodom and Gomorrah and says, I'll go there. And the scripture specifically says that he chose Sodom and Gomorrah because it reminded him of Egypt. Well, how did he know what Egypt looked like? Because his uncle had taken him there and he said there is prosperity Lot would end up losing everything that he had 
And now Elimelech has decided, I will go to Moab. I will find new bread because there's no bread in the house of bread. And of course, there's disaster. It starts with a fairly good beginning. There are wives for the boys. They get married. But then what happens? The father and then later the sons all die within the space of 10 years. Everything that looked so good in the beginning has turned into a disaster. The promise has turned into a curse. See, that's the problem when you visit places like Moab and Egypt. It looks good in the beginning. It looks good from the outside. It looks good because we think, okay, this is a, a good opportunity for me. But when you're not where you're supposed to be, you'll find not the promise, but a curse. It's what happened with Abraham. It's what happened here with Elimelech and his family. You see, sometimes we think instead of facing bad times, I need to leave. Lord, I don't know how many times I've seen that in marriages. People face difficulties. And what's the solution? Let's split up. Let's leave. Let's go find something new. And all we're left with is disaster. And that's the thing about when you go where you're not supposed to be. The promise always turns into a curse. What we find then and what we're left with is the state of Naomi. Naomi is going to be central through this book. It's named after Ruth. And of course, Ruth is the heroine. She's the hero. She's the great, she will become the great mother of faith. And she will have her place of honor in scripture and deservedly so but Naomi needs love not the warm and fuzzy love she needs genuine love And she's reached a point in her life that many people do where they think, I need love, but that is impossible. There's no hope for me. 
She has three conditions here that she thinks she cannot overcome. Number one, she is alone, even with companions. She has two daughters-in-law that she's very, very alone. She's so alone that as we will deal with next week, she's going to tell these two companions, leave me, go home, go somewhere else. You see, she's so alone that she doesn't feel like anybody can help her and anybody who tries to help her, she tells them, it's no use, leave. She's alone. This is a normal aspect of grief. When we lose someone who's close to us and she's lost in some ways the three most important people in her family. She's very alone. Number two, she's suffering. That's what happens when disaster hits. We suffer. They've looked at it and studied it over the years and discovered things that the Bible revealed to us. And that is that basically when you go through severe periods of grieving in your life, you're going to get depressed. It's normal. It's part of who we are. It's part of the way God created us. We make the mistake sometimes of trying to p pull people out of it and say, like, come on, go on, go on, go on. No, there are times, and the Psalms address this, when I teach this in a class, I always have them read Psalm 88 because it is the most depressing psalm in the Bible. It's a lament, and there are a lot of laments, but most of the laments are, I'm not having a very good day, or we're not having a very good time, and God, where are you at? And yes, we hit the bottom, but then we resolve it by saying, God, I believe somehow, some way you're going to show up. Well, Psalm 88 is so bad, it doesn't have the God you're going to show up. It sort of shows you when you're at your lowest point and you don't believe that God himself can help you. Anybody that's ever dealt with depression and struggled with that, know that you reach those moments where you don't even think God can help you. Suffering. You're suffering and you think that that is the rest of your life is suffering. What do you need? Well, you need that love. You need that kessid in your life, but you think it's eluded you. You don't think you'll ever have it in your grasp again because you're suffering. The third state of Naomi, she's old. 
in her mind, there is no prospect for the future. No prospect for the future. And again, what this is setting the stage for that we're going to go through in the next few weeks is setting the stage for the needs that we have, and we have these needs, and guess what? Whether you're rich or poor, young or old, whatever state you're in, all of us need love. The scripture I read to you earlier from Timothy says that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That is the promise from God, even when we think it is beyond our grasp. What the story of Ruth is going to show us is that this love can come to us even when we think it can't. God is there. The Psalm 88's in the world, as I said, they're there to show us that God knows, yeah, you can get in that point. And it's there in the Bible to let you know that when you're at that point, there's nothing wrong with you. God knows that. He put it in Scripture to say, yeah, I know, you'll get here sometimes. Sometimes you're going to get here and you're going to be suffering and you're going to think there's no hope, there's no future for me. There's no prospect for me. You're going to be very much like Naomi. When she gets back to Israel, she'll tell her friends, don't call me Naomi anymore. Because Naomi is a good word. She says, call me Mara which means bitter. You may be in a spot and you may be stuck in that, but this series that we're going to go through here is that sometimes God's going to find you even when you think you cannot be found. The search for love because we all need it. And even when we think it's beyond our grasp, we have stories like this that remind us no, it's not. No, it's not. So, what do you do when you're in that Psalm 88 stage where you're just like, oh, life is. No hope for me. You're going to do very much like Naomi is going to do. She's getting ready to take a journey. She thinks it's a journey of no hope. But some strange things are going to happen on this journey. She's going to find love. And she's going to find that God can do things that she thinks are impossible. That's the God that we serve. He does the impossible. You may think, no hope. And God is saying, just wait. Just wait. There's hope. You may think there's no future. And God's saying, just wait. Just wait. There's a future.
Because as Moses said in Exodus 34, when he tells us about that story of the great revelation of God, he found out that God is full of mercy, full of kissed, full of love. And he shares it with us. And we find it sometimes in the most unlikely places and the un most unlikely times we will find the love that God has for us. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you today for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I just want to pray for anyone here who may be a struggling with things in their life. They may have reached a moment where they think it's never going to get better. Lord, I just pray for them that you would sustain them through this period. And God, that they will find a better day they will find a new hope. They will find a new future. We trust, God, that you truly have given us power and love and a sound mind. We trust that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, please. If you have a need this And here we go. How do I know when God is opening and closing doors? It's real easy. When God closes a door, it's closed. No matter what you do, no matter what you try, it's closed. By the same token, I've seen when God opens a door, and I've seen sometimes, I've seen every power that be try to close the door, and... God says, yeah, I'll let them lock it just to show you how I can unlock it and open. And so sometimes we can see the power of God in great ways. Okay? How does God define love? There are many different definitions, but maybe the easiest, easiest one is to see it in that famous verse John 3 16 for God so loved that he gave love without action are, is empty words God shows us his love by his actions too often times we listen to the words of others when their actions are telling us the truth. I had a lady one time tell me that uh, she and her husband were having problems, and she said, he tells me that he loves me. I said, that's good. Where is he? Well, he's in another state. I said, what does his actions say? His actions are sort of saying something different. And so God always links love with action. Okay? Thank you.